the fantasy world that was associated with Hollywood productions at that time. But here's the thing for our story, you know, well, here's a big thing. They would find that by the mid-1920s, about twice as many people were going to the movies on a weekly basis than going to church. So church going was around 60 million, and movie going was around 120 million. I gotta tell you, that's more than the population of the United States. So there clearly were a number of people that are going to the movies more than once. But the movies, you know, will have an impact. Lenin described the movies as a weapon of culture. They they come along and they kind of they they give they present the values in in whatever way to the people, and they and they do have this kind of impact. And generally speaking, I'd like to suggest to you that the movies were generally cosmopolitan and worldly. They represented kind of the modern perspective. Many of the movie makers, uh, directors, producers, and even actors were Jews who came to America, already had kind of a general worldly bent in terms of the way they saw things. And they would, you know, extend those notions through the movies. And understand the movies could be all the way from extremely progressive and benign, benevolent in attitude to horribly racist and condescending and re retrogressive in their, in their perspectives and everything in between, of course, the whole thing. But the movies uh, industry is really coming along and having a big impact, of course, on the people of the 1920s. So we do see that that is another one of these manifestations of the triumph of the modern. Now, um, another place we can go in the car, I hope you guys want to go with me, is to the ballpark. How fun will that be? And what I'm really suggesting to you is that the 1920s were like the first great moment of the rise of spectator sports in America, where sports really began to kick into gear and begin. And, you know, some people would describe this as a pathological development. That, you know, it's the distraction of the movies, the distraction of sports, you know, that become, uh, that take our attention away from maybe larger, more important issues. And maybe, you know, I think that is true. You know, in a nation, in a world that's changing, you do often need something else to pay attention to. It's kind of one of the sad things, of course, that the pandemic has shut down sports, and sports is something that many people use uh, to kind of distract themselves from their, their worldly situation. But anyway, in the 1920s, we see an explosion kind of, of spectator sports, and you know, one place you might go is to the ballpark. So what I want to do in this section is just you know, suggest to you some of the sports are really becoming big at that time. College football was huge in the 1920s. College football had a pretty checkered past. It, was, it had come out of the late 19th century. In the early 20th century, it had developed to a really brutal game. And indeed, there were a series of deaths that took place on college football fields. And it got to the point where Teddy Roosevelt was threatening kind of to abolish the game or something like that. But, you know, those that wanted to continue, uh, inc you know, strengthened the rules. They increased the potential safety from the equipment point of view. And by the time we get to the 1920s, college is big. It was a huge thing for the American, um, for the American public. And this is the age, I don't know if you guys are into football history, but of Red Grange, who was the galloping ghost, the Wheaton Iceman, uh, the great runner from the University of Illinois, you know, kind of single-handedly began to really make college football very popular. It's hard to, act, to measure exactly how good he was. The films that we can see of him playing are often these really green. He actually looks like a ghost, kind of a galloping ghost across the field. He seems to be able to outrun just about everyone else on the field, but I have to let you guys know that, you know, there was mostly only white guys on the field. There were not necessarily African American athletes and others that could have been uh, part of the part of the opposing team. He did go to the Chicago Bears, so single-handedly he gave some kind of foundation to the National Football League. Though I do want you to know that the National Football League really will not take off until after World War II, and really in combination of the, the rise of television. Television was critical to the you know the two of them that incredible symbiotic relationship and it has driven that into become America's. Great uh, sport pastime. But college football was huge. We see this in the fact that uh, the University of Michigan built a stadium that could seat 100,000. And of course, all the naysayers said, you'll never fill it. And I'm pretty sure they never have not filled that sucker, right? And they've expanded capacity to 114,000. They fill it every damn Saturday. And of course, they got a waiting list a mile long of people who want to get in if they could. They did overdo one stadium. Uh, so this was Sh Soldier Field in, in uh, Chicago. And they built it to seat 150,000 people, just these monster bleachers. And really, it was horribly designed. It was just long bleachers on both sides. In fact, the end of the bleachers were like 50 yards from the end line, which is 60 yards from, of course, the touchdown line, which is 100 and whatever, you know, from the other end. I mean, you, you couldn't see anything if you were way down at the end of it. When they rebuilt uh, Soldier Field in one of its iterations, it's now in the, you know, a really incredibly new, brand new one, 
but you used to be able to see the old stadium bleachers kind of heading out beyond the stadium where they where they stretched out. I gave you a sense of, of what, what, what the old stadium was like, and that didn't work out very well. Okay, but uh, college football was huge, of course, and Americans were uh, deeply interested in it in the 1920s. Boxing was big in the 1920s. It was the first million dollar gates in the 1920s. Um, it was uh, the first heavyweight championship of the world. Uh, it took place in New Jersey. Uh, the European champion, his name was George Carpentier, came over to face the American champion, who was D Gene Tunney at that time. And the most interesting thing to me about the whole thing is that the bout took place. Gene Tunney's going to win the American one. He became the world champion. But they put, they just threw together this arena, and it could seat 20,000 people. So, you know, they had the, the boxing ring there, and then they had the arena around it with 20,000 people. But the guys who built it had no clue as to the structural issues associated with having all those people on it and them moving. And, you know, when the people finally came in and sat down, the bleachers were sort of rocking and rolling, basically, very unstable. And everyone was glad that the fight ended very quickly and they got the people out of there. The promoters wanted everyone gone. Before, you know, they just they took them down that arena before anyone realized how dangerous that had been for just about everybody. But anyway, boxing was really big in the 1920s. Tennis was big in the 1920s. This is me doing my tennis stuff. You can see that I have a tremendous backhand, what can I say? And um, the great star for America was Big Bill Tilden. He would have been the guy who won the uh, U.S. Open, Wimbledon, and stuff like that. Tilden's an interesting man. He was a homosexual, but a, a closet homosexual, who lived his life kind of in the fear that, you know, some someday he might be exposed. And... He wasn't, you know, but it's interesting. We believe that many of the sports writers knew that he was gay, but for whatever reason decided that, you know, not, they're not going to ruin this guy. But you can imagine the, the amount of fear that he lived under of always, you know, the potential of, of exposure that could take place. So, you know, um, tennis was big, though. And, but the greatest sport of the era was, of course, you can see exactly what I am doing here. I am moving my arms in a strange fashion. I am batting in baseball, of course. Baseball was the greatest sport of this particular era. And I'm batting left-handed. I am batting left-handed, right? Yes, I am. Because the greatest star was, I'm sure you guys know who it was all about. It was George Herman, better known as Babe Ruth. So, you know, this is the golden age of baseball, where baseball really begins to take off. The Americans begin to embrace it, you know, as they never had before. Babe Ruth, of course, is critical in the story. He kind of single-handedly dragged baseball from the doldrums of the dead ball era, from the scandal of the Black Sox scandal. You know, he, he hit more home runs than the rest of the league combined, of course, and just really uplifting this game. You probably know that he began as a pitcher for uh, Boston, and Boston recklessly sold him to the Yankees, of course, you know, and uh, the result of that was a curse that was laid upon the Boston Red Sox, which apparently the statute of limitations finally came, uh, came up uh, as we reached into the 21st century. But anyway, he goes to the Yankees, of course. Uh, he's going to make much more money than the President of the United States, of course. He begins to show you the imbalance of, of sports salaries relative to just about every other salary you can, you can think of. And um, anyway, they built Yankee Stadium basically for him, and it would seat 54,000 people. And again, the naysayers said, you'll never fill it. And of course, baseball doesn't always fill the stadium. There's a long, those dog days of summer where it doesn't happen. But think how many times the Yankees did fill it, and think how many times the Yankees won the pennant, and think how many times the Yankees won the World Series, of course. You know, baseball really became one, uh, one of the major activities, major sports attractions of the 1920s. And so... And again, this is a very identifiable, you know, sports is so big in our lives, of course. Sports really became big in the life of Americans as we go in the 1920s. So, you know, the movies. And we could go to the movies, we go to the ballpark, we could have a hell of a lot of fun, okay? Now, it might not be us in the car. This is more like you guys in the car. But one thing I want to suggest to you is, you know, the, an expression of the modernization of the 1920s, the triumph of the modern 1920s, was what I'm going to call kids in cars. And I have to tell you that I, I really do like to present this part of my little story to you. Uh, there's nothing I like better than to have a good story, you know, something that happened to me, a story that I could tell. And when it's relevant to the history, of course, you know, it makes it even more uh, satisfying to me. But true story. So one afternoon, uh, when I was done teaching at Palomar College, I took my, bi my bike ride that I often do. And you know, I started at Palomar College in 92, 92. And I was looking for, I ride mountain bike, so I like to ride mountain bike. So I saw the P Mountain, and I wondered if I could ride up the P Mountain. Now, you guys all know you can't ride, like, right up to the P. That's super steep, but there's a road over to, I'm going to say, that's the western side of the P Mountain. It's just a fire road, or, you know, I don't know exactly what that road was built for. When I started in Palomar, they, were, they had the avocado trees up there, and they had bee boxes up on the top, 
there were years where I never went to the top because the bees were just endlessly there. And I remember I'd ride my bike up and I'd have bees just kind of cruising over my helmet just about all the way up there. But, you know, since I found out that it was a, it's a tough ride, it's a hard one. You know, these days, I have, you know, it's both technical and steep. And it's like, you know, I'm, I'm getting the age where I can manage steep or technical, but technical and steep becomes more problematic. So all the times that I rode up there, including I've ridden up this, there sem this semester, I pretty much had to get off my bike at some point to get myself up over a really difficult part of the whole thing. But I've been doing this, you know, since 92. I can't even tell you how many times I've ridden up there. I'm guessing it's like 300 or something like that. So just, you know, it was a relative, it's a nice, fun mountain bike ride coming out of uh, Palomar. It's a beautiful view up there. You get to see all the way to the ocean, of course. See Mount Palomar. You can actually see up towards the, the Mount San, I think the San Gabriel Mountains, you know, to the north. Anyway, and so I like to do that. And usually I would just ride my bike up there, of course, and no one's ever there. But this one day, and I think this would have been in the 90s still, when I was still pretty early in my career, I'm riding my mountain bike up that little, and you turn off Borden Road. And in those days, Borden Road was, wasn't even open. You just, you know, had closed. They, they blocked it off on both sides. So I just turn off Mount Borden Road, and I head up in the little dirt road that kind of cruises up the side of, uh, of the P Mountain. And you go up this little section, then you kind of take a turn to the right. And I'm coming around that turn to the right when I see a car just sitting there in the middle of the dirt road. And I got to tell you, it's a, it's a rough road, but you never see anyone up there hardly. And of course, you don't see a car. So, you know, I, there's a yellow car and right kind of in the way. So, you know how you go kind of from the general to the specific when you see something. And all this is happening very, very fast. So, first thing I saw was a yellow car. I'm going, yellow car, what the hell? Second thing I saw, two fingers up, was a foot up against the windshield. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Third thing I saw were the white pasty butt cheeks of an adolescent American male. And so, in that moment, I knew exactly what was happening. Now, I love how you get in a moment like this, and it's kind of like a pervert test, you know? Are you a pervert or are you, are you not a pervert? And if I was a pervert, of course, I would have stayed there and watched them, but, you know, if I wasn't. I, I'm not. I know it because I turned within a heartbeat. And to be honest with you, the major feeling I had at that moment was, damn it, I can't ride my ride. You know, they're, they're blocking the damn road. And I have to tell you that, I mean, I guess I could have squeezed by them, but it would have been like, here am I on my bike and here is them. I mean, excuse me, don't let me trouble you as, you know. You know, it was so interesting because I was giving this lecture the next day. So it set me up, you know. So I'm telling this story to my students and, you know, they're kind of laughing at the whole thing. But one of the, one of the guys in the class said, you should have yelled, that's my daughter. And I'm like, oh, you, I don't want to kill a baby. That would be horrible to have that to happen. And I have to tell you that I have my own kids in cars experience, of course, and I would not have wanted to be disturbed in the way that the, that would have disturbed them. So I don't think they ever even knew that I was even there. So I was just quick getting the hell out of there. But it tells you, here's the tale that I want you guys to know. Kids do interesting things in cars. And that's the whole point, and we will see uh, that, that there's going to be some sense to all this. So what's happening? Here's my kids in cars concept.